This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his good friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you something that maybe you already know. The fact that America's favorite wine is port wine. Did you know that? Well, if you didn't, you'll know why port is the way out front favorite if you'll just sample some Petri California port. You just look at that Petri port and you know it's good. That wonderful deep rich red color. And Petri port is so clear. Well, just hold it to the light and you can sort of see right through the glass. But what you really want to know about a wine is how does it taste? And I'll tell you something, I... I've never yet been able to find the adjective that'll do Petri Port justice. It's wonderful, honest. You just got to taste it for yourself and find out for yourself. You love that Petri Port in the evening after dinner when you're sitting around listening to the radio. And it's perfect to serve your friends when they come over. Oh, and you can show that Petri label, too. In fact, you can show it proudly. Because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. <laughs> And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's ready for us, so let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Mr. Barto. Good evening, Doctor. <laughs> well, the puppies seem very happy tonight. Yeah, tonight, yes, but you should have seen them this afternoon. I doubt if there were two more frightened little dogs in the whole of California. Well, we did not. Well, control yourself. What happened, Doctor? Well, I took them for a walk on the beach. As we were scrambling around a rocky point, a seal popped his head up in the water quite close to us. What did the puppies do? Oh, both of them barked at it furiously. And the seal? Blew a few bubbles and then barked right back. <laughs> I don't know what the world's speed record is for short-legged dogs, but I'm sure they broke it. <laughs> you know, Doctor, I'll have to join you on one of those afternoon strolls of yours. You always seem to be having such exciting adventures. Oh, and talking of that, how's about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Well, I'm all ready for you, my boy. In fact, I was looking over my notes on the case just before you arrived. This is another story in which Sherlock Holmes' elder brother, Mycroft, played an important part. Mycroft Holmes was seven years older than Sherlock, and some said it is superior in powers of observation and deduction. That sounds like heresy, Doctor. No, 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 young fellow, my lad. Holmes himself was the first to admit it. In fact, if it hadn't been for his incurable laziness, Mycroft would have been his formidable rival to his younger brother. However, Mycroft did hold a position of considerable importance at the Foreign Office, and it was there... But tonight's story begins. It was in the winter of 1899, and Mycroft Holmes, after a gourmet's lunch, was reclining full length on a leather settee. His eyes were closed, his hands were folded across his stomach, and his breath came rhythmically. A cynic would have declared that Mycroft Holmes was taking an after lunch and snooze. But Mr. Holmes' secretary, a gentleman by the name of Gardner, was a realist. He tapped on the door discreetly. Then he rapped on it. And still there was no response, so he opened the door and entered. After a moment, he gave what he thought was a discreet cough. <coughs> <coughs> Mycroft Holmes opened his eyes and folded his hands and said, Found it, Gardner. Must you come in here and bark at me so soon after lunch? I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, but I thought... You that... thought that as I was lying down with my eyes closed that I must be bored. And so you came galloping in. Oh. Well, what do you want? There's an old lady outside, sir. She insists on seeing you personally. I've tried to get rid of her, but... What's her she... name? Mrs. Hudson, sir. Mrs. Hudson? Huh. Show her in, Gardner. Show her in. Very good, sir. Undoubtedly a message from young Sherlock. How are you, Mrs. Hudson? Oh, good day, Mr. Holmes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I won't take up much of your time. Sit down, won't you? Don't leave us, Gardner. I may need you in a few minutes. Very good, sir. Now, Mrs. Hudson, what's the message? Message, sir? Didn't my brother send you with some message that he was afraid to entrust to the ordinary channels? He's always so confounded and dramatic. Oh, bless your heart. No, sir. I I've come to you with a little problem of my own. I didn't like to bother Mr. Sherlock Holmes with it. He's been so busy lately, and 
And he's looking very tired. And so you came to me. How delightful. I thought you wouldn't mind, sir. You've always been so nice and friendly to me. Pure laziness. It is less effort to keep an old friend than to make a new enemy. But tell me your problem. Well, it, it's really my sister's problem, sir. She keeps a boarding house at 14 Kensington Garden Square in Bayswater. And she's convinced one of her boarders, a, a man who has a room on the first floor back, she's convinced that he's a bird man. And what in heaven's name is a bird man? Do you know, Gardner? No, sir. I can't imagine. Oh, it's like a werewolf, gentlemen, except that the man turns into a bird. Oh, come now, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, I know it sounds daft, but my sister's in a dreadful state. Of course, I've been with your brother long enough, sir, to know that such things are nonsense. But how can I prove it to her? What reason does your sister give for holding her strange belief? She keeps finding pigeon feathers in the room. Now, the man doesn't keep pigeons, sir. My sister knows that for a fact. Has she found any traces of scattered food on the window ledge? None, sir. No signs of any pigeons, except the feathers. My sister's a wee bit fey, Mr. Holmes. She's the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter, and you know what that means. Just the same, she's not imagining things, sir. She's shown me the feathers herself. Where were they, Mrs. Hudson? Somewhere on the floor by the end of the bedstead, sir. I brought some along with me. Here, sir. And we found some more in the gentleman's cupboard where he keeps his clothes. I, George, I wonder what if... What is it, sir? I'll tell you in a moment, Gardner. Uh, Mrs. Hudson, this matter will require a little private investigation. You may return to your sister and tell her not to worry. I shall get in touch with you as soon as my inquiries are completed. Good day to you. Good day, sir. And I'm very much obliged to you. Well, Gardner, what do you make of it? An old wives' tale, sir. You're not treating it seriously, are you? Yes, I am. One of these feathers shows evidence of having had string tightened round it. That suggests a captive bird. Now, a captive bird smuggled into an obscure boarding house would point to something of the greatest importance to us, Gardner. By George, sir. You mean carrier pigeons? Exactly. And remember that we're at war and that the Boers have obtained several important and highly confidential secrets of ours lately. We know there's a leak somewhere. This requires an active investigator who can work with discretion. Now, I could work with discretion, but uh, I don't feel too active at the moment. <laughs> ah! I have it. I want you to write this letter to my brother. Disguise your hand, use plain, cheap notepaper, and don't sign the letter. He won't be able to resist that combination. Are you ready, Gardner? Yes, sir. Very well, then. Uh, my dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, uh, we know of your proposed investigation of the tenant in the first floor back at uh, 14 Kensington Garden Square. We warn you, as you value your life, keep away from the... We warn you, as you value your life, to keep away from the case. And that, my dear Watson, is why we are driving towards 14 Kensington Garden Square, disguised as building inspectors of the London County Council. Well, I must say, it's a very challenging letter, Holmes. Unsigned, yes. I notice. Written on cheap note paper and in a disguised hand. No clue there, I'm afraid. Well, we're, we're entering the square, Holmes. Uh, let's stop the cab here. Uh, you can drop us here, cabby. Uh, off you are, cabby, yeah. It seems a little incongruous in these costumes for us to arrive in a cab. Yes, I suppose so. Here you are, Cabby. Oh, thank you, Governor. Supposing this mysterious tenant to the first floor back should be in his room when we get there. We must hope that our disguises are convincing and keep our wits about us. Now, this may be a trap. Yes, just what I was going to say. After all, you've never heard of 14 Kensington Gardens until you received an unsigned letter two hours ago warning you to keep away from it. I don't like the look of it. There we are, number 14. I suggest that you let me do most of the talking. Good Lord, yes. My cockney accent doesn't compare with yours. Who do you want to say? Uh, we're from the London County Council. We are. We've had complaints about a leaky gas jet in the uh, first floor back. Oh, that's Mr. Green's room. He ain't home. Well, that don't matter, my dear. We'll go up and take a look. Come on, Bertie. Right. You are, Alfie. Want me to show you the way? The missus is out, shall No, thanks, dearie. Me and Bertie can't get lost, can we, Bertie? No, of course we can't. Of course we can't. <laughs> oh, look at him laughing. <laughs> uh, come on, Bertie. Oh, uh, I do not to be beside the seaside. Oh, uh, uh, I do not to be beside the sea. Uh, 
Diddly yum pa pum pum, diddly yum pa pum pa pum. Nice house, Bertie, ain't it? Yes, Elf. Nice house can be, this house. Oh, I do like to be beside us. Inside there. I do like to be beside us. Here we are. First full back. Better make sure the bloke ain't home. Oh, I do like to no, be no, beside us. No, no, ain't home, Alfie. No? Huh? No, well, all right, let's go in. So this is the mysterious room, eh? Well, it looks perfectly ordinary, doesn't it? Yes, a pressing example of the squalor of boarding house life. Hello. What's this on the bedspread? Feathers. Must have come out of the pillow. No. He's a pigeon step, this old chap. And look here, Watson. Attached to the bed rail. Well, that's only a piece of string. String, yes, but... With a small metal ring on the end. The ring such as is used to place around a homing pigeon's leg. But why should someone keep carrier pigeons in an obscure boarding house like yes, this? Why indeed, why indeed? The answer could be that the tenant of this room is engaged in some sinister activity that requires the use of carrier pigeons in sending messages. Yes, there's no evidence of the birds being kept here. That's true, Othello, that's true. Uh, possibly the owner of this room is given to... is given a pigeon by one of his superiors, brings it here, affixes his message, and releases the bird. But why couldn't he just take the message to where they keep the birds? Well, in that way, he would run the risk of being picked up with uh, dangerous and incriminating messages on well, What kind of skullduggery involves the use of carrier pigeons, you suppose? We're at war with the Boers in South Africa, Watson. What could be more logical than that a spy in their pay should be using this method to smuggle important information out of the country? Right, cheer of yourselves. I wouldn't mind being... Shh! Somebody coming. Look out. Who are you? What the devil do you think you're doing in my room? Well, my name's Bert Lemonard. I come here to look at your desk, Paul. Sir, don't lie to me. Who are you? It's like I say, Captain. My name's Bert and I come from the Landy Camp Council. Yeah, very well, then. If you won't tell me the truth, perhaps this revolver will make you change uh, your look mind. Look here, Captain. Look here, Captain. Grab his revolver, Watson. Yes, right. Holmes, where were you? I slipped behind the doors. This gentleman opened it. Yeah, me, sir. Your overcoat the coat seems extraordinarily well filled with chest, doesn't it? Why not slip it off? Yeah. It's a bit warm in here. Oh, let me alone. Right. So we, you were right, Holmes. He had a pigeon under his coat. Yeah, uh, yes. See if you can catch the bird, will you, old chap? All right, here. Come on, Pidgey. Pidgey, come on. Come on, little fella. Come along, Pidgey. There he comes. That's it. <laughs> look at the little fella. Snuggled up on my arm. Friendly little fellow, isn't he? Yes, I... Look out, Watson. The gentleman's revolver. Yes, going after and it. when I get it, I'll... Oh. A beautiful uppercut, Holmes. I'm, uh... I'm afraid he'll be unable to talk to us for some time. How fortunate he told us where the message was hidden before we indulged in this little set, too. What do you too. mean? Did you say anything about a message? No, not verbally. But I was watching his reflection in the mirror as he entered the room. His eyes first glanced at this top drawer on the dresser here to see if we touched it. It was obviously the most important spot in the room. Let's see. Ah, uh -huh. here we are. A message already rolled up and in its container. Oh? What does it say, Holmes? It's in code. Which is not surprising, but I don't think it will be very difficult to decipher. Yes, and when you've done that? Then, my dear fellow, I shall compose a code message of my own and persuade this pigeon to lead us to its master. Watson, that you're wondering why I brought you to Dexter's Music Hall in the Edgware Road. Well, I must confess, I'm a confused, Holmes. First of all, we go to Baker Street and we spend hours poring over some obscure book. And you write out a message, attach it to a pigeon and let it loose. Now you bring me here. I hate to question you when you're working, but I should be glad if you'd give me some idea of what's going on. Of course, old chap. At times I must seem confoundedly mysterious, I'm sure. Here's the situation. The obscure book I was studying was the table of ciphers. I was trying to decode the message we found in the room on the first floor well, back. obviously you succeeded or we wouldn't be here. Yes, the key word was Louis Botha, the name of the Boer leader. The message was a report on the number of troops now in training at Aldershot. Then you were right. We're mixed up with a ring of enemy agents. Obviously, old chap. So I kept the original message and composed another using the same code and dispatched it by carrier pigeon. Well, what did you say in your message? Meet me tonight, 8 o'clock, table number 3 at Dexter's Music Hall. What made you choose this place as a rendezvous? Well, I happen to know that it's a common meeting place for all world characters. And which is table number 3? 
The one over there in the corner. I reserved it. Then why don't we go and sit down there instead of standing at here back? I thought we'd give our visitor the opportunity of showing his hand first. He won't be expecting Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I fancy. <laughs> This woman coming on to sing. Do you ever see so many feathers? Not allowed to have a bow except the one who died. So yesterday he came and took me walking a blue sky. Holmes, Holmes, look, look. A man just sitting down at table number three. What's with it? Look. Sid Trimble. Sid Trimble, who's he? A dangerous criminal who once worked for the Moriarty gang. We've caught a prize pigeon, Watson. Better have your revolver handy, old chap. Undoubtedly, he'll recognize it. Right, you are home. Right, come on, then. I'm so glad you're able to keep your appointment, sir. Sherlock Holmes. It's a trap. Ah, uh, don't try any tricks. I've got a revolver here, Sid. How'd you like this table in your face? It's... <laughs> oh! Watson, you didn't shoot him, did you? No, no, he knocked my hand. The revolver went off. I... The shot went wild. I swear it did. Yes, of course. Look at the wound. There are no powder burns. The shot was fired from some distance. Holmes. Holmes, he's... He's dead. Out of the way. Out of the way, please. Now then, what's going on here? Uh, Constable, this man has been killed. Yes, then it's easy to see who did it. Well, I didn't put Constable, if that's what you're thinking. No? Then why are you standing here with a smoking revolver in your hand? Come on, you. You're under arrest. But you can't arrest me. I'm Dr. Watson, and this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I don't care if you're the King of Siam and the Bishop of London himself. You're under arrest, and I'm taking you both to Scotland Yard. <laughs> the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. And if you don't mind, I'll take that second to say just one word to the lady. And that word is muscatel. Petri California muscatel. I want you women to know about it because Petri muscatel is one wine that practically every woman likes. Maybe because it's such a beautiful color, like, well, like pale gold. But I guess really because Petri Muscatel brings you the wonderful flavor of luscious, sun-ripened Muscat grapes. And that's a flavor. Try Petri Muscatel after dinner or any time as a change from Petri Port. Have a bottle of each on hand. When you buy Petri wine, don't buy one, buy two. Remember, if it's a Petri wine, you know it's a good wine. Dr. Watson, that was really one for the books. So you got yourself arrested on a murder charge. Yes, Mr. Bartell. It's a very humiliating experience. I was taken off to Scotland Yard in the Black Marat. It's like any common criminal. The wretched constable wouldn't listen to a word that I'd got to say. Well, Sherlock Holmes went with you, of course. Naturally. But we arrived at Scotland Yard. My mortification was complete. And I found that I was led into the presence of our old friend, Inspector Lestrade. Holmes spoke to him at some length. But I could see from Lestrade's expression that my position... Now I can see uh, what it is, Mr. Holmes. You see, I know you both. But I must say there are lots of them here at the yard as don't like what they call your eye-handed method. But, Mr. Our personal likes or dislikes have nothing to do with it. No, no, of course they haven't. It's purely a matter of evidence. Well, I know that, Dr. Watson. And the constable's evidence was as clear as the nose on your face. The dead man was shot through the head. And you were standing in front of the body with a drawn revolver but in your hand. But my dear Lestrade, my dear Lestrade, there were no powder burns on the wound. Yeah, that's what you tells me, Mr. Holmes. But I'll have to wait for the official report on that. The police surgeon's examining the body now. You understand, gentlemen, I'm not saying I'm sorry that uh, Sid Trimble's dead. He's been a thorn in our side for a good many years. In fact, I... Oh, here's the uh, police surgeon now. Uh, Dr. Hendrix. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you, How do, you do, do, gentlemen? I, I'm a great admirer of you both, and I'm sorry to see you in such a very unfortunate plight. Oh, thank you, thank you, Doctor. Thank uh, you. What were your findings, Dr. Hendricks? Well, I just extracted the bullet, Lestrade, and I'm very much afraid it's the same make and caliber as the one missing from Dr. Watson's revolver. Yes, but that doesn't prove that I fired the fatal shot. A forty-five Colt's a very common weapon, Doctor. It proves nothing. Now, Dr. Hendricks, as I was just saying to Inspector Lestrade before you came in, the only fact that show my friend guilty 
would be powder burns on the wound, thereby giving <coughs> proof that the bullet had been fired from close range. I entirely agree with you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, then, uh, as there were no powder burns... Oh, no, the... but there are powder burns, Mr. Holmes. What? Very distinct ones, too. Good Lord, I... Uh, well, uh, I just... I don't understand, Holmes. I'm sorry, gentlemen, huh? to be the bearer of bad tidings, but I have my duties to perform. Yes, and I'm sorry, too, Dr. Watson. Huh? I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to let you leave here. Of course. You must consider yourself under arrest. I never felt more despondent in my life. Oh, cheer up, old chap. Well, how can I? Locked up in a prisoner's cell. Looks as if I might end up at the gallows. Don't worry, Watson. You'll be out of here before the night is over. I promise you oh, that. I wish I felt as stubborn as you do. How do you propose to do it? Oh, with the aid of a little hard thinking. Thinking? Huh. That won't unlock any cell doors, thinking. But it will, old fellow. It's obvious someone's deliberately trying to incriminate us. Let's try and reconstruct the killing logically. Hmm? Seth Trimble was a member of an espionage ring. I sent him a false message. After he'd uh, left to keep the appointment, one of his colleagues trailed him to the music hall and killed him before he could be betray anything to us. Yes. Yes, that's undoubtedly the way it happened. But the powder burns, Holmes. How do you count for them? There were none just after the shot was fired. We know that. And yet Dr. Hendricks assures us that there are very distinct powder burns now. May we come in, gentlemen? Yes, yes, of course you can, Dr. Hendricks. Oh, uh -huh. Hello, Lestrade. Yes, I thought we'd come and uh, chat with you, Doctor. Well, that's, that's very nice of you, gentlemen. Yeah, not a bit of it, Doctor. You know, it, it hurts me to see you in here, and that's a fact. And I can't bear to see a fellow medico in such plight without coming in to see what I can do to help, Watson. Yeah. You're very quiet, Mr. Holmes. Am I, Lestrade? I was thinking. You see, uh... what, old chap? I have it. You have what? The answer. You'll sleep in Baker Street tonight after all. Mr. Holmes, what are you talking about? The murder of Sid Trumbull. The incriminating powder burns were obviously faked. Watson and I know that, whether you and Dr. Hendricks believe it or not. The question is, how were they faked? I think I have the answer. Uh, Dr. Hendricks. Yes, Mr. Holmes? If a blank cartridge were fired at the wound after death, it would produce powder burns, wouldn't it? Undoubtedly. Yeah, but uh, who could have done that, Mr. Holmes? Ah, that's the point, Lestrade. Who had the opportunity? The constable who brought the body here. True, old chap. Huh? Also, you, Dr. Hendricks. That's perfectly true. Yeah. Well, I had the opportunity, too, Mr. Holmes. I spent half an hour in the morgue alone with the body when it first came in. Well, you've narrowed it down to three suspects, Holmes. I hope I don't hang before you find the real killer. I've found him, Watson. Why, what? Oh, see, Mr. Holmes. Holmes. The answer is simple, Lestrade. The powder burns were certainly fed by a blank cartridge. Now, if a blank cartridge were fired into a wound, the uh, wadding would have penetrated and distorted the wound. Yes, but supposing the person had removed the wadding from the blank, Mr. Holmes? Its effect would still be uh, quite apparent to the police surgeon who removed the bullet. Am I correct, Dr. Hendricks? Entirely. The surgeon could not fail to identify the marks, Mr. Holmes. Exactly. Uh, therefore, only one person could have fired that blank cartridge without detection. The same person who made the incision necessary to remove the cartridge would also remove all traces of the shot. You yourself, Dr. Hendricks. Uh, you, Holmes, I, I believe you're right. <laughs> That's an ingenious theory, Holmes. Surely you're joking. Am I? And how do you account for the pin feathers on the collar of your coat? Uh, I'm not... The devil with you, Holmes. Here, here, come back here. Uh, Doctor. Uh, uh, constable. Don't let Dr. Hendricks get away. Scott. Scotland Yard itself harboring an enemy agent. <laughs> on my soul, Holmes, you've done it again. I must say you've got sharp eyes. I didn't see those pigeon feathers on, on Hendricks' collar. Uh, confidentially, my dear fellow, neither did I. But Hendricks' guilty conscience knew they might be there. It was a shot in the dark, and I had to take it. If you'd spent the night in, in a prison cell, I should never have heard the end of it, I'm sure. Never. I want to see Mr. Mycroft Holmes, please. But follow me, Mrs. Hudson. He's expecting you. Hi, sir. Ah, there you are, Mrs. Hudson. Come and sit down. Oh, thank you, sir. I, I got your message and came over right away. In the first place, Mrs. Hudson, you may tell your sister that she needn't worry any more. I'm sure she'll find no more pigeon feathers in her room on the first floor back. No, sir, thank you. But she knows the fact. Because the bird man left her yesterday for good. Some strange men came and took him away. 
And today, she's let the room to a nice young commercial traveller. I- I'm really sorry to have bothered you with her troubles, sir. I'm very glad you did, Mrs. Hudson. Thanks for your information. An enemy espionage ring has been broken, and the British government is deeply grateful to you. <laughs> You're always one for a joke, aren't you, Mr. Holmes? Well, I'm glad you're not angry with me. I'll be going now, sir. Just one more favour I'll ask before I go, though. Anything, Mrs. Hudson. What is it? Please don't tell your brother about this, sir. He'd be so angry with me for wasting your time. Well, Doctor, that was really a swell story tonight. Although it was a bit unexpected for you to have been arrested. Yes, indeed, Mr. Martell. Uh, when you're a detective like uh, like Holmes or a, a doctor like myself, well, you've got to be prepared to meet the unexpected every once in a while. Mm, I suppose so. Of course, you wouldn't know about things like that, being a, a wine expert yourself. Oh, now, wait a minute, Doctor. From the way you talk, you'd think I spent every waking moment in a... Nice, cool wine cellar, tasting wine from morning till night. Well, don't you? <laughs> oh, now, doctor, I'm no more a wine expert than you are. All I know about wine is that it either tastes good or it doesn't. And I know that Petri wine does taste good. And that's because the Petri family took time to make good wine. Generations of time. Why, the Petri family's been making wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the business has always been family-owned and operated, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And they've learned plenty. So no matter what type of wine you want, for any occasion, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a weird adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had in the east end of London. It concerns a most unusual stage play, a badly frightened actor, and a blood-stained razor. I call it The Strange Case of the Demon Barber. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Greek Interpreter. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California... Invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.